comment in this lab is that uh, we have recruited some brilliant students from all over year and fall. And today we have been reading our papers, and we encourage them, encourage them to develop into publications, and many of them have. And today I'm going to present a project a little along those lines. This is a presentation based on a presentation I gave earlier here, but now it's more advanced, and an article based on this talk will be the lead article in the next issue of Foreign Affairs. So I'm trying to follow the precept that I advocate and uh, <laughs> talk about modernization and inequality. This is a take on it. The uh, topic of inequality has become very current, and I think a very good reason. It is growing, the degree to which economic inequality is growing is dramatic. There has been a huge economic growth in the last 30 years, and in the United States and many other countries, almost all of the growth has gone to the top 1%, to such an extent that uh, Bill Gates and Buffett, who are two, the two richest men in America, are worried about it. They think they should be getting taxed more heavily. The Tea Party wing of the Republican Party does not fully agree with this position, and they tend to dominate the Republican Party, at least in the primary elections, so it's a very hotly contested problem. But I think I agree with Warren Buffett and Bill Gates. This is a tremendously dangerous problem that threatens to undermine democracy itself. The power of big money in primary elections has been dramatically demonstrated. It is, uh, I can recall instances where a given candidate in the primary election was 20 points ahead, and then a billionaire came in and flooded the uh, state of North Carolina or Georgia with attacking ads. And by the primary election itself, uh, Mitt Romney won by 20 points. It's a kind of frightening example that, especially in the primary stage, where opinions are relatively fluid and information is relatively scarce, big money can really decide who gets to be the candidate. And I think this goes that the billionaires should choose the candidates is, in America, not the, not the prevailing interpretation of the models. And it is a dangerous in what it's supposed to do. This is one example of many that uh, I'll go over some of the other signs in this talk. Inequality is uh, a big problem. And to the point where, though my own career has been in large part, based on analyzing and following the progress of new non-economic issues, which have taken the center of the stage. One of the presentations in this LCSR uh, brought up evidence of the center is true that non-economic issues have come to dominate the party platforms of the major parties in recent years. And I saw this as a great thing because it brings in environmental protection, gender equality, gay, uh, the rights of gays and lesbians, etc. A number of new issues, non-economic issues, which have taken center of the stage. I now am forced to reassess my own position in that I think this is, although this is clearly a good thing, there's a balancing act that we need to keep where the classic economic issues now need to be given higher priority. I would say both the new and the old issues will be, are and will be important. But I think we've gone to the point where we have moved too far from emphasis on economic equality, which of course, when I was a graduate student, I took a PhD freedom exam, and uh, one of the questions was, what is the difference between left and right? And I gave the exam, and my answer, because I studied hard, was state ownership of industry, economic redistribution, and government regulation of the economy. And this was what the left meant in those days at the University of Chicago when I passed my freedom. I didn't mention any of the new issues, which later on I discovered. But at the time, this got me through my freedoms because that was what the left was about. Today, it is much less, and cultural issues have overshadowed economic issues to a degree that is alarming. 
It's not that I don't, I'm still tremendously in favor of gender equality, having three daughters, and things like this. It, it is, this is and always will be important. But we need to pay more attention to economic equality. One of the classic issues of sort of the Marxist interpretation of politics, what it's all about. It's not all that it's about, but this is an important part. So let me get in line. Early capitalism was real. It ruthlessly exploited the workers, driving wages down. Uh, and, and the Russians have perhaps have heard a little of this, the notion of uh, the iron law of wages and exploitation of the masses. And I'd say it was true. 19th century capitalism was really awful in the post. Things changed. Labor unions became legal instead of conspiracies. Labor-oriented political parties. Ah, Labor-oriented, it says I should be sitting on this for this one. This uh, labor-oriented party became important. And she knows, she knows what to do almost always. Uh, anyway, they led to Marxist inspired political parties, some of them like the British Labor Party, pretty far from the Marxist emphasis on bloody revolution dedicated to coming to power by democratic means, but in spite of Marxism. And they had a big impact. And social class voting was strong. Again, in my freedoms at the University of Chicago, I'm not sure if there was a question on this, but if there had been, uh, I would have said, along with Seymour Martin, that class voting is a tremendously important factor in deciding how things go in many countries around the world. Social class voting was a important fact that the workers were mobilized. Finally, what changed the story, I believe, was the mobilization of working class-based political parties that became powerful at the polls. They had unions and parties and grassroots organizations that brought these economic issues into the center of the stage in Britain, etc., leading to eventually the New Deal and the Roosevelt and the U.S. and similar things in Europe and finally in post-war era, extensive social welfare states with genuine redistribution of income and social security and policy like that that alleviated the situation a lot. That if capitalism would be placed on life, it might not survive if it had not had these reforms. But it did. The reform revitalized and went on forge. So I would say Though the profit of inequality clearly is Piketty, who everyone has heard about now, a very influential uh, analyst of capitalism, and uh, it's what he argues is an inherent feature of capitalism, growing inequality. He argues, though he's, I would say he's clearly right, inequality is growing, the evidence is massive, I would say. This is one of the facts we can take as a fact and uh, is growing at a lot of rate. I completely agree with his take on this. He sees the fact that most of the 20th century was a period when inequality was declining. And it went from high levels down to low levels around the 50s, 60s, 70s. And now, since the 70s have been re regained, he views this, actually, two thirds of the 20th century as a kind of fluke. They were random shocks. World War I, World War II, Great Depression that upset the normal process. I don't quite agree with this, uh, but if you only take into account economic factors, as he tends to do, he tends to see it as all economically driven, this is perhaps a normal interpretation. From my perspective, the mobilization of working class parties was the real reason. It was not random shocks, it was a systematic, inherent part of Modernization. modernization changes society profoundly. It is a process of industrialization, urbanization, occupational specialization, increasing education of the working class that brings them into contact with each other in factories and they become literate and able to cooperate increasingly, increasingly. And these deep rooted forces, aspects of modernization, not random shocks, are the reason why inequality decline. It is coincided and it preceded this 
World War I, supposedly the first of the men shots. This was going on well before World War I. The mobilization of the working class basically, I think, was what drove declining economic inequality. And thus, I well firmly agree with Piketty on is inequality growing? Is it a big problem? Absolutely. I see the interpretation as one of the different cause is what has happened now? And I would say the cause is the demobilization of the working class. Actually, to some extent, the disappearance of the working class. They are much less numerous because of changes in occupation structure. Again, deep rooted aspects of modernization. Working class has become much less numerous as one part. So you could not win elections with just the working class. There are 15% of the population, 12% of the population today, some advanced industrial societies. We have service economies overwhelming. This means you can't base a coalition fighting inequality on the classic working class sort of Marxist inspired form of any longer. It, it just wouldn't work. This is one part. Structural change of the industrial post-industrial society. Another one is the, the very new issues that I, in my younger years, and I still cheerfully celebrate, but with now with somewhat an awareness that it has mixed consequences. That the new issues have overshadowed the old issues to such a degree that one can, we have a situation one way of viewing it is that it's the 99% versus 1%. And the 99% would clearly be a winning coalition, not that very far. If they were mobilized, they lack what Marx would call class consciousness. I think something is growing. There is some awareness of this. But in my talk, I'm trying to show that this really is a pervasive problem that is not just the workers in this particular class today. Middle management, most of the middle class, including the economic elite of middle class lawyers in the U.S. This is the ruling class kind of. Uh, lawyers, doctors, professors are being commoditized. They are having the security that they once had undermined systematically, making academic careers less attractive than they once were. Lawyers are being replaced with computers and outsourcing doctors the same when I get an x-ray read at the University of Michigan Hospital. The x-ray is taken at the end and I read in Bangor. And then they shoot it back by electronic means. It seems that doctors, highly competent doctors, are a lot cheaper in India. And this goes on so that the medical profession is being outsourced and they're being turned into employees of big organizations against whom they have very little bargaining power. So the salaries, uh, the incomes of doctors and lawyers are stagnant, and I think doomed to go down. Making these once the sort of every mother hoped that her son would be a doctor, or at least a lawyer. And uh, sort of this is no longer the golden ticket. The, okay, I have some wonderful slides, so let me get into them because uh, I've given you the overview. Now let's, okay, one of the things that happened said this. The rise of new issues. This can be traced, I claim, to an intergenerational shift that made post-materialist values increasingly widespread in the past industrial society. This is a survey carried out in six countries in 1970, in which I first measured materialist and post-materialist values, hypothesizing The rise of the welfare state and the economic growth of the post war era have brought about new conditions under which people grew up fundamentally different conditions. Instead of what had been the norm for all humans for most of history, survival was uncertain, you might stop. The post war generation, instead of experiencing World War I, World War II, the Great Depression, the supposedly land of shocks, Piggy mentioned, which led to starvation, and even in the US, starvation. Uh, People grew up with these new conditions that led them to have post-materialist values that de-emphasized the classic economic issues, emphasized new issues, environmentalism, gender equality, etc. And this changed the spectrum profile. Uh, it gave rise to a new politics dimension under which, in addition to the classic 
us is left by parties based on pleas, uh, based on economic issues, the uh, classic economic redistribution of the policies that would the right being opposed to redistribution, reducing government spending. Instead, these issues remain, but they were increasingly overshadowed by a new politics dimension in which environmental protection, gender equality, rights for gays, and things and so on, were prominent issues and are today. And abortion, for example, is in the US a, a gut battle fought, and so this is a litmus test. If you're a good guy, no abortion. If you're a bad guy and due to eternal hellfire, abortion's okay. But this is kind of the way one side views it. These new issues, I think, were tremendously important. Progressive, they changed the world, and I and they will continue to do so. These are things going on, but one of the things was they cut across class lines. Post materialists, by as a theory, tended to be from the most secure strata tended to be middle class origin, moving a big part of the support for the left to the middle class. Conversely, there was a cultural reaction against the new issues in which traditional values were being eroded and part of the working class shifted to right-wing parties like the National Front in France uh, or the Tea Party in the West, which is not a party but a movement, and de-emphasized the classic economic issues. This is from a paper that was presented here in the lab. I build on it cheerfully. And uh, this was uh, one of our brilliant students who isn't here today. Produced this paper showing the decline of economic issues in party programs of 14 advanced industrial societies. That starting back in 1950, economic issues generally exceeded and were much more widely spoken of in party platforms. Than economic issues, the non economic issues. And the red line being non economic issues gradually caught up. There was uh, a crossover about 1986. And ever since then, non economic issues have been far more prominent, a, a lot more prominent, in the party platforms of political parties than the economic issues. This is a phenomenon of some importance. On one hand, the good news is. Issues that were not on the agenda at all are on the agenda today and they're changing the world. Women are taking part in politics in the US. We might get a woman as president this next election. I would say, my guess is, I'm betting a little more than 50 50 on it. Uh, we too early to tell. Uh, gays and lesbians have come out from being absolutely taboo, powerless, repressed to. This year, the US Supreme Court found a constitutional right to same-sex marriage. Huge change. These elderly justices of the Supreme Court, or at least five of them, decided that they wanted to be on the right side of history, that this was a trend, and they were right, and that they made a change that had norms that have been around for thousands of years. So things are changing, and the progressive changes and with this social class voting detail. When I took my freedom, I was perfectly right saying that social class is a uh, big issue. But in practically all countries, social class voting indices have declined dramatically. In 1949 or 50, there are lots. In elections, if you had a voting class, as in Sweden, a social class voting index would be produced. 75% of the working class voted for the left parties, and 25% voted for the conservatives. This gap of 50 points, 75, 25 is a really big gap. This is, and many countries had social class voting indices close to that. Even the US had a social class voting index of 45. Things have changed over time, so that by the 1990s, social class voting had declined. To such an extent that in the US, it was almost random. Knowing a person's social class, you could flip a coin in predicting what, whether they move to the left or the right. It's remained at very low levels. 
Uh, income predicts a public involvement, but education predicts a democratic. So social class weighting has defined, and this is a big change. Furthermore, with the shift, uh, the with outsourcing and automation, the numbers of the working class are defined by. So that you can't win an election with just a working class. The big change since 1970 has been economic inequality has risen dramatically in most of the vast societies. It's been a curvilinear process. Starting about 1900, it was quite high. The top decile got 45% of the total income, for example, in many countries. The US was a little bit more egalitarian than Europe in those days. We were only 41%. Things have changed the point where today there's been a dramatic decline and it began to reverse about 1975 to rising inequality to the point where in the US economic inequality is higher by quite a bit higher. First of all, higher than it was in 1900, this era of the robber barons ruling the country and really serious exploitation of the So the economic inequality is even greater than it was in 1900 in the US. It is greater in the US than it is in Europe. That's another reversal. So the US wants the land of opportunity and still mythically the land of opportunity. In fact, has become a country where a person from a poor family has less chance of rising than a person that is true in Canada or Western Europe. It's a big change. The uh, has not been limited to the Western countries. In fact, dramatic change is the fall of the Communism has led to the rise of the elites in China and Russia to the point where both China and Russia today have even greater economic inequality in the U.S. Uh, this is, the model would be rotating that way, it's great. Under Mao, China was very unitary. The directors of factories made four times as much income as the ordinary workers. They had some income. But today the figures, the, the figures have risen in the U.S. to 20 times, 50 times, 250 times as much. Huge disparities between the managers and top elites and the ordinary workers. So this is a pervasive tendency by no means limited to the U.S. and Britain. And it is, I think, built, it's linked with the structural changes of organization. One optimistic interpretation would be that market forces will offset this situation. Though industrialization was a decline of agricultural employment, it created larger numbers of jobs in uh, high-paid jobs in the industrial sector. Similarly, it is claimed that the shift from industrial manufacturing to the knowledge sector is going to create large numbers of high paying jobs in the knowledge sector. But it's not. The empirical evidence is it is not doing that. Sorry to say, there are some jobs, and I mentioned Sergey Brin and Larry Paisley, they did extremely well. But they are kind of exceptional. They are way Jobs in Microsoft, Google, pharmaceuticals are well paid, but the percentage of people working in the high technology sector has been flat for the last 25 years since the financial numbers are, uh, the numbers are big enough to take into account. Here we see the decline of agriculture from over half the workforce down to 2%. Virtual disappearance of agriculture as where people work in these advanced industrial societies. Rise of industry to replace it initially, and then decline of industry to the point where it's now at about 15% of the workforce. Dramatic decline in manufacturing. The service sector has risen, and the optimistic myth is that these are all high paying jobs, and they include some of it. But if you take out the high technology sector from the service sector, leaving the hairdressers and hamburger flippers and room McDonald's and so on, they're very different. High technology sector has not been producing large numbers of unpaid jobs. What is happening is possibly, I hope not, but possibly foreshadowing. This is totally important. This is figures I just gave in the US. This is for a number of countries. Same flat trend. 
Sweden, UK, Canada, France, and Germany show the same flat employment in the high technology sector. So Sergei Brin and Eric Page are unfortunately not typical. They are big success stories that I applaud, but they're not worthy really companies. I think it will take political muscle and not just market forces to change this. It will require mobilization of the 99%, which is very diverse and has this myth still that if you become a doctor or a lawyer, you're gold. My impression, having looked at this, is though, of course, doctors and lawyers make higher salaries than ordinary factory workers, and professors do rather than well. These Professions requiring high advanced education are staying, and they are not moving ahead. That means computer programs are not just replacing those skilled jobs, they're replacing doctors, lawyers, professors, highly educated professors, professionals. This is a massive trend which I think is resulting in the whole economy up to something like the bottom 99% is being hollowed out, no longer making gains, and to some extent, if you got a law degree, it used to be you know, for sure at a job. Today, a significant share of the graduates of law schools don't get a job. What used to have, we used to have a huge amount of young lawyers would be doing research. Today, that research is being done by computers. And there still are good jobs at the very top. But this is no longer the situation we want to have. Median real income by educational level in the US shows very flat real income. Not just for the less educated, but even for people with college graduates and even for people with postgraduate degrees. Flat income in real terms. Education is not a panacea, I would say. Of course, get education. You'll do better with than without. But it is not, just rising education is not going to cure the situation of rising inequality. The gains in real income are going almost entirely to the top 10%. Here is a graph contrasting. The real income salaries of people with graduate degrees, law degrees, MDs, PhDs, highly educated. The red line is absolutely flat and it's close to zero because there's a scale that goes up to $12 million a year. The CEOs, by our dates for them, were only making $3 million a year at the top in real income. They at least have made progress. They've gone up in real income. They've gone up to $10.5 million a year. The gains have gone almost entirely to the top. What this means is the future is, I think, the future will not continue to be like this. Eventually, what will happen will be what once was the mobilization of the working class. It will be a mobilization of a sufficiently large share of the 99% to back policies in which the large and growing national income, instead of going entirely to the top 1%, is used in ways that benefit society as a whole. The group here, I think, if we could spend a weekend together could come up with a rich program of good ways to spend money on research, education, health, etc. Since my time has run out, I won't go into it, but could it be done? I'm sure it could be done. The question is how and when there will be this new mobilization of what is now a dis increasingly dispossessed 99%. Uh, since we are running a little short of time, I'll try to keep the uh, Q&A session down to 10 minutes. Therefore, please make your questions short and hopefully it will be also uh, concise answers. Yes, Dmitro. Uh, I would like to ask you, how do you measure those high-tech uh, industries and because uh, once you mentioned high tech and then you mentioned ICT because if you went, if you uh, turn to high tech industries according to NAC classification they include uh, computers 
and, and pharmaceuticals, for example, and aerospace technologies. And if you go to knowledge intensive industries, for example, they include things from publishing to legal activities. And there will be a wide range of jobs and professions if you do knowledge intensive uh, jobs. So the question is how do you count that? And what do you think would be the best measure of that? I would have to show you my paper because the measure gets complicated. Basically, yeah, I would not include simply highly educated people who do use computers, but a much more restricted uh, interpretation because there's a big difference. Uh, first of all, it is people who are producing uh, high tech rather than simply using it. And secondly, the, the, this is a stagnant in numbers, and the stagnant in income uh, of even highly educated people. It's a situation where we're getting very good at manipulating industries so that you have very few people working. The numbers are down, down, down. They're replaced by computers, outsourcing to some extent, but mostly computers. And that means you can have a tremendously profitable industry. The stock market in the US is doing well. It's very high. There's a lot of money being made. But it is not going to the 99%. It's almost entirely going to the 1% at the very top. Thank you. I, yes. Um, uh, thank you very much um, for the very interesting talk. I have a question um, uh, about the graph that you said that the uh, non -economic, uh, just non-economic issues are rising in their uh, volume in political parties. Brokers. Actually, I mean, I guess in contrast with, for example, institutional and the theory, we have been able to just claim that the, non the economic issues are dominating all the institutes, including politics. It would be very interesting just to hear your thoughts on that. Maybe it is somewhat a different just type of uh, economic dominance, or are we just happy not to have, uh, to have a decrease of economic Okay, I'm going to get Compile these figures on the basis of the party manifestos project, which has coded the party platforms of all major parties since 1950, a huge database. And for sure, the number of mentions of economic issues in party platforms has been overshadowed by the mention of abortion, gay rights, immigrants. I would say this is. Not only does the database from the party manifestos project bear this up, but it seems to me that the issues that are shaking up European and American politics these days are more than non economic issues, which enable that this makes it possible to one percent to not have a polarization along the economic issues where they would surely lose. Instead, if you make it a fight about abortion, yet you can get large numbers of people opposing abortion and not thinking about economic inequality. In terms of what has happened dramatically in the lot of the recent years, the rise of the National Front in France to being, in some surveys, the biggest party in France, the rise of the Danish People Party, in a country known for being tolerant among most countries, to being, in recent polls, the biggest party in Denmark. This is clearly not the mobilization of economic issues. It's anti-immigrant, xenophobic feelings. Mm -hmm. And with the thanks from all this nice talk. Yes, uh, when actually you presented the graph, actually, I noticed uh, the inequality of what in the exomity block that was on the rise, except for the Czech Republic, which is paid very much uh, in the same level. Is there an explanation? Uh, the honest answer would be, I don't know. Uh, in the Czech Republic, okay, one point that I would completely agree is, this is not due, this is not carved in stone. Sweden has led less than most countries. National policies can make a difference. This is a very crucial point. I don't know what's going on in the Czech Republic well enough to really know why. My guess is they have policies that are different and don't allow this in the same way Poland and Hungary. China and Russia, I hear rumors are ruled by oligarchs. Uh, 
it's maybe unfounded rumor, but there, there's some evidence. Uh, the U.S., a different kind of oligarch. And let me go back to, it is not doom for all advanced industrial societies. Sweden once had much higher income inequality than the U.S. Though it has had some increase in recent years, it's still at a much lower level. I think I know a little about Sweden. Uh, he probably knows more than me. But my feeling is that the welfare state is relatively advanced there and they have policies that can change it. In other words, we are not trying to tilt with windmills or swim upstream against the tide. Uh, government policies can affect it and indeed do, do affect it. 